David had big plans for Dominici, but events around him were spiraling out of his control. Georgia had broken away from the Soviet Union, plunging the country into economic and political turmoil. Early 90s were quite difficult time for country. Economically, we had a civil war, and it was time of real collapse of Soviet system. So it was hard for science, very hard, but we were continuing to work. The jaw had raised many questions, but could not provide all the answers. To contradict the skeptics, David needed to find a skull to help fill in the gaps. Archaeology demands patience. It would take eight hard years to get the breakthrough he was looking for. In 1999, Manisi came back on the stage with a new skull. It was really amazing. This season we had fantastic discoveries, two skulls in the same season. And both the skulls showed that Manisi hominids are very primitive. And then we published the skulls in Science magazine. We got real international recognition and a lot of fanfares. The skulls were the oldest outside Africa by more than half a million years. They were also very small, far too small to fit with accepted theories about who first left Africa. The first human travelers were thought to be tall, strong and have large brains, vital to survive outside the African continent. But the owners of the Dominici skulls were far more primitive and had small brains. The scientific community was captivated. It was clear that Dominici was going to be a very rich site indeed. Amendable is fine, but amendable by itself doesn't provide a lot of information. Mandibles plus crania are much better, and of course, two crania are twice as nice as one alone. We recognized that Dominici was going to be very important as a place where we could document the first excursions of humans coming out of Africa. Once more, Dominici was the center of intense international interest. It's early July 2004, and this year's dig is underway. Since the first major discoveries at Dominici, David has sought to share this incredible site with the world's scientific community. Grab yourself a trowel, a hammer. Some of them are feeding into the Paleo Lake. Over there. He recruited specialists like geologist Reed Ferring, who's worked alongside the Georgian team for more than a decade. If I could have drawn up a list of the things I wanted, a menu of qualities and, and characteristics and contents, they would have looked just like Dominici, right here at the juncture of Africa and Europe and Asia. So we can see what's happening between those three continents in the busiest time of the early stages of human evolution. Up until today, we have almost no literature, no scientific background on, on how the earliest humans would have survived and survived well in a very temperate environment like this. Science has no border. Maybe it's a slogan, but it's reality. And when you are sharing, you are stronger. Team is stronger, and Georgian science is integrated in world science. And that's highly important. Where is, where is Kerki? Where is Kerki? David ensures that Dominici stays under Georgian control. Specialists in a range of disciplines must work together and share the discoveries together. Unusual practice in the conservative world of archaeology. We were all trained in school that this interdisciplinary approach was the best way, and then our role models never practiced it. Here we're really trying to be good role models for interdisciplinary research, and I think we can attribute the present success of that whole technique to uh, the vision of David. I missed also, I have not also. I have this. I took pictures myself. No, no, it's a different. David's team has had great success. Since 1999, two more skulls have been found, 
along with various jaws and body parts thought to come from six individuals. This has given the team the unprecedented opportunity to study a group of early humans rather than just one individual. The new arrivals all came from one small pit, known as the Champagne Room. This is one of the richest sports in the world. Could you imagine two skulls and three human jaws were found here? So this is amazing. Maybe this is a place for Guinness Book. I mean, to find one hominid skull is, is an amazing thing. It's like winning the Super Bowl, right? It's just a once-in-a-lifetime thing, and we've got four skulls now, and several individuals uh, represented here. So this is, uh, we're kind of like repeat champs, I guess, of the Paleolithic. <laughs> But we'd like a pelvis, we'd like a femur, uh, and that would be really nice. That would give us information that we don't have here in terms of biomechanics, of locomotion. These were the first people to leave Africa, and so there are a lot of assumptions about their body type, how long and tall they were, and so that would help to answer those questions. Questions also remain about how the first humans got this far. Before Domenici, technology was thought to be the key to surviving out of Africa. But experiments by the Domenici team show that the tools found here are primitive and easy to produce. The scientists believe that humans who left Africa should be well developed mentally and technically, not have a Swiss army knife, but they're weapon should be sophisticated enough. And Manisi changed it completely, this idea. Primitive stone tools can be made by breaking one stone with another. This would have been the cutting edge of technology for the Domnisi people. Judging by the stone tools that we find in Domenici, it's evident that the hominids that made those tools were very primitive. And they did not have a well-developed tool-making technique. The hominids were simply trying to achieve a cutting edge for the tool. This is the cutting edge here. This heavy chopping tool was probably used to break bones, to chop meat and work on wood. It was used to do everything, a universal tool. 